California edition. I'm Brad Palmer. It's glad you're with us. Our guest, Don Wagner, member of the California State Assembly. And, sir, you're in your second term. In your first term, suffice it to say, California was facing tremendous fiscal challenges. It's remarkable that the state seems to have turned around so dramatically so quickly. Well, Am I you're, off? You're, you're not off. Okay. When, when, when you hit the, uh, the public with a multi-billion dollar tax increase, lo and behold, the state government has more money to spend. But That's let me ask are. you, though, there's no doubt that the passage of Prop 30 helped in terms of the fiscal house being in order. But as I understand it, it's not just that. The economy really is turning around. There are two other things to go along with the tax increase. Right. One is, yes, the economy is turning around. My sense is not as quickly as we'd like, okay. and we could do some things to help spur it. But it is turning around. Right. There's no doubt about Amen. that. And, and right. that is a great thing, and it's a nationwide thing, not right. just here in California. The other thing that's fueling this budget health is the fact that we've had a lot of folks, it's, it's our understanding anyway, who have frankly accelerated some of their I capital saying, gains right. to get it into one tax year. And Meaning it was December of 2012 where that acceleration occurred. And so they're paying sooner rather right. than they otherwise would. Meaning that we've got to be careful about the budget surplus that we're running because a lot of that money may be one-time money and you don't want to spend it on ongoing things. Sir, I'm fascinated by the, I'll call it the debate, between the governor and the chief legislative analyst. For years, governors have been accused of being rosy, overly optimistic in terms of their budget projections. This year, it's the chief legislative analyst who has said, Governor, you're too pessimistic. The surplus is even greater than you say it is. What do you make of that? Well, I'm fascinated by that <laughs> role reversal right. as well. And hats off to the governor, because what he is doing is attempting to budget very responsibly. And I think he's taking notice of what I was just mentioning before. Some of this money may be one-time money, so let's not turn around and spend it all this year. So kudos to the governor for some fairly conservative budgeting on that front. There are other choices he could make. Our courts are woefully underfunded. It's so interesting you mention that because even the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, who generally Chief Justices are silent, they don't get involved in politics, has spoken very loudly. She is very concerned about court clock. It's not a problem that can be ignored any right. longer. There are folks out in, in rural California uh, places that are seeing their courtrooms close and the effect of that is that for example a woman who needs a domestic violence restraining order is having a tough time getting into court children who need family court services adoptions and, and conservatorships and guardianships aren't getting service what's so, that's a yeah, problem. What's so interesting is the governor has been singularly focused on K-12 funding and so the vast majority of his or the surplus is flowing to K-12, which in a lot of ways feels good, but should it be that some of the surplus shouldn't be flowing just to K-12? We have other priorities. We do have other priorities, and the Prop 30 tax increase was sold in large measure on education. Fair. It is fair for the governor to respond to that, and education we know is a priority of Californians. But I also want to mention that it is particularly important that government function appropriately. One of the proper functions of government is not all of the welfare programs we've got. We need a safety net, but a proper function is a functioning judiciary. So we may not, we're to the point where we right. may not have that. So is there bipartisan support in the legislature to fully fund or better fund the courts? Not fully fund because right. there is, better but fund. to better fund, absolutely, Brad, there is, there is bipartisan consensus for that. Uh, when we return, sir, I want to speak more about the budgetary situation. I also want to talk about whether the majority party, the Democratic Party, is looking to increase taxes in this era of surpluses. We're speaking with Don Wagner. He is a member of the California State Assembly. For our viewers on HLN, we thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. Sir, I want to continue our conversation and speak with you about taxes. Um, the voters of California were rather generous in November. I've said on this program, I was surprised Prop 30 passed, let alone by 55%. The governor has been very clear that he is not looking for more taxes. Um, but there are proposals percolating through the Senate, through the Assembly, often by members of the Democratic Party, to increase taxes on oil, sodas, cigarettes, plastic bags, bullets, strip club patrons, marijuana, lots of different areas. What's your sense of whether the Democratic Party in the Assembly and Senate is trying to be restrained 
on tax increases or are they getting a little giddy? Well, they are getting, to use your word, a little giddy. It is true the public gave a significant tax increase to the governor, but it was sold specifically for education and for public safety. And it should not, in my mind, be read as carte blanche for raising taxes. Yet there are bills working their way through both houses that tax everything, as you've, as you've mentioned. What's interesting, though, is, as I understand it, a lot of those bills aren't surviving. They are getting killed. There, there is very definitely a responsible wing of the Democrat Party led by the governor, and even the leadership in both houses has been somewhat, uh, as I say, responsible mm -hmm. and restrained in what they, they're, they're permitting to go forward. That said, at this point, I'm not entirely sure that the rank and file mm -hmm. are going to follow the leadership because there is an enormous pent-up demand amongst liberal constituencies, the, the unions but and those folks, for, for more money. And what's interesting is what they're saying is the cuts of the last four or five years were so draconian that we need to backfill at some level. What's your sense of that? Because the, the, this budget really doesn't provide monies to make up for the, quote, draconian cuts of the last four or five years. Well, let's put in context the cuts. They aren't cuts. They are reductions in increased spending that was planned for, but that didn't materialize. Take a look at our general fund spending this year and compare it to 2007, the last year before the big recession. I'm thinking you're going to find a really tough way of saying those are cuts as people sitting at the kitchen table who do have to cut when they're doing their family budget understand cuts. In government, it's a cut in the rate of growth. And so there's a lot of pent up pressure to make up for what had been promised but unattained because of a bad economy. Uh, but those aren't necessarily cuts, Brad. I want to get a sense from you about the interplay between the majority and minority parties. Because in November, the Democrats did something no one expected. They took a two-thirds supermajority in both Senate and the Assembly. Whether it's a functioning two-thirds is a, another conversation because of okay. special elections. But that being said, there was this fear um, amongst Democrats and Republicans that the Republicans would be completely shut out in Sacramento because with a two-thirds supermajority, you don't need Republican support. I've spoken with a variety of members and they've said that the Democrats have been a bit welcoming um, in a variety of areas since the supermajority surfaced. Is that your sense? Yes, they have. They have? Okay. I, I think the reason for it is interesting, but it is definitely there. <laughs> right. And the reason for it is because given the supermajority at this point, there is no question that Democrats own California right. lock, stock and barrel. Mm -hmm. Anything that goes wrong is going to be entirely uh, on their shoulders. They are looking for some bipartisan cover, and to the extent they're willing to engage with us, and we can help shape some ideas, make some bad legislation better, uh, I'm all for engaging, and I think that uh, my colleagues and I have been doing what we can to engage with the Democrats, and uh, if I say hats off to the governor, as I did a few minutes ago about his conservative budgeting, hats off to the Democrats who do want to work and craft some better solutions for California. It is interesting, because in the Schwarzenegger era, it seemed as if their best friends uh, the Schwarzenegger administration were Democrats. He was a Republican in this era. At some level, it does seem as if the Republicans are a backstop for a Democratic governor. At, at some level, but that supermajority is urging uh, a lot of really bad stuff, and it's going to be a question of whether they so stand up to the So anything in which you're particularly proud this um, particular session that you've been involved with? Well, I have been working very hard at trying to get the money restored to the courts because I do oh, think yes, that, is, that. Is, is so significant. And as I say, there has been some bipartisan support uh, for that. I've, got, I've been carrying a couple of bills to help, uh, for example, military spouses. That's one mm. that's working Tony its way Atkins? through. Through Are the, you working with Tony Atkins? Um, this, is a, this is a different bill. Okay. This is a different bill. Um, we are having some success getting okay. that one moved through uh, the process. Unfortunately, some of the good, uh, uh, in my mind, pro-business bills find themselves uh, dead in the, in the first know. committee. They, they, they find themselves in. But uh, we, continue, we continue to work because we're trying to make this okay. uh, the, the, the growth even more so that we were uh, talking about earlier. I hear you. His name is Don Wagner. He is a member of the California State Assembly. My name is Brad Palmer, and you've been watching California Edition. In what year did the Democratic Party last hold a supermajority in both houses of the California legislature? 1883, 1941, 1963, or 1977? The Democrats last governed with a two-thirds supermajority in both the California Assembly and the Senate in 1883.
It's Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Danny Fitzgerald, he is the manager of the Imperial Valley Enterprise Zones. Uh, Enterprise Zones are back in the news before we talk about what's brewing in Sacramento. I want to get a sense from Danny, what exactly is an Enterprise Zone? An Enterprise Zone, technically they're called a geographically targeted economic development area. Got it. So there's 40 of them in the state of California. Um, areas apply for this designation from the state to be able to receive very significant tax credits to retain business in that area and to attract new business that in that area. Now, they are different from what was known as redevelopment zones. We know that redevelopment was eliminated. The California Supreme Court upheld that elimination. Explain how redevelopment zones are more different than enterprise zones. Enterprise zones are all based on tax credits. Redevelopment areas were based on property tax, tax increment, potential municipal financing, whereas the enterprise zone, the business that locates there, they receive very specific tax credits, and they only those are only tax credits against any income that's earned. I see. And so the, the local jurisdiction isn't controlling any of the money. The state really isn't controlling the money. All it is is basically that business then pays less tax for locating in those economically depressed areas. So let's talk about enterprise zones because they did survive the attack w on redevelopment. There was talk about whether the governor wanted to take out enterprise zones back then. But there's the similar mantra about these zones that some of them really aren't economically depressed. You look at areas like Venice and in, in Los Angeles County or Los Feliz in Los Angeles County that these aren't you know, economically depressed zones and as a result the governor is starting to look at enterprise zones and whether they should be eliminated. Right. I mean, and that's something that has come up again this year. We're, we're faced that with the recent revise of the May budget. Right. The elimination is back on the table with it coming up with a new plan. But the stark reality is, is the vast majority of these zones are very economically depressed. And for example, where I am Please. is, you know, areas of 30 percent unemployment, where this area median income is below forty thousand dollars, where you have significant needs. You also have areas of other areas throughout the Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, Merced, Stanislaus, areas like that. All the way in Northern California and Siskiyou County. These are serious areas, but not just that, it's certain parts of even the urban areas on the coastal regions where you have around the ports in particular mm. in, in Los Angeles and those types of areas to try and revitalize those areas as well, as well as even parts of Oakland and even the, the, the lower levels of San Jose as well. What some of the critics of Enterprise Zones also say is that they're not the job creators that the proponents would argue they are. Explain your sense about whether the zones do create jobs, the types of jobs we would want created as a result of a program like this. I think one of the first things to do is to take a brief step back and understand why Enterprise Zones came please about. Please do, please. Because one of the th reasons they came about was to help these severely economically distress distressed areas. Like, for example, when they came out, it was right after the Watts riots uh -huh. and that type of target. So in other words, it's to bring income into those areas where that are high crime, high gang, high poverty, etc., and basically to take the hardest to hire and give them job opportunities. So it may not necessarily, the job creation obviously is a factor. It does result in that. In particular, that's something I try and do in Imperial County. But a lot of the other is the job retention. So that way, say, employer, an employer that has an employee that resigns, quits, moves on, what have you, maybe even promoted, and they have a new opening, then they're looking at the hardest to hire individual, perhaps the ex-felon, perhaps the veteran, perhaps that person who's been unemployed for five years. It, maybe it's a, you know, someone who'd stayed at home with their children and are now going back right. to work. So maybe, you know, and those people then are given an opportunity because those are the ones that are eligible for the hiring credit. And it's simple that when you hire folks in those categories, you will get that tax credit. Right. What it is is there's, there's 13 different categories. And so what it is is they are the hardest to hire categories. They are the, they are the lowest income individuals. They are poor individuals. And this is giving them those opportunities. What I'm wondering is, could it be that we need to look at whether enterprise zones, the 40 of them, should still maintain that classification. Clearly, you've mentioned some that are not abusing the designation, I guess you could mm -hmm. argue. Maybe there are some that are, that have already graduated, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, can we look at that because 
I mean, there was a sense in the redevelopment fight that, you know, if they just had time to kind of clean up the abuse, maybe redevelopment could have survived because there were the golf course stories mm -hmm. and all of that. Is that what needs to be done on the enterprise zone front? Just, you know, let's, let's, let's really look at this. Maybe there are some abuses, but overall it's a great program, so let's just clean it up. Right. Well, enterprise zones actually by statute only last for 15 years. So for example, the enterprise zone I manage will expire in 2021. And so over 15 years, you have the opportunity to be able to provide those. And then the state, you know, if they decide to renew them at those points in time, after the 15 years, they have that. For example, last year, there were 42 zones and two of oh, them really? expired. There was Did one they graduate or they just couldn't get the redesignation? They actually weren't allowed the opportunity for a redesignation. Because there, the statute allows up to 42. And then they, these uh -huh. two were expiring in 2012, one in Watsonville and one in Lancaster and okay. Palmdale area. Okay. And, both of the, and so the, the department that administers the program decided not to open up for another opportunity. They did not issue an RFP, okay. which is the standard procedure that's always has happened in the past for zone opportunities, and they did not release that again. Hmm. And so they decided then to let the zones expire at an administrative level. So what should should we look at whether certain areas should not be should not maintain that designation even in the midst of that 15 year period i'm just trying to get a sense because i do you know i've looked at the redevelopment debate and there's no doubt that it seemed to come on so quickly and there was just no time for the proponents of redevelopment to kind of take a breath and say wait a second let let's tinker with this a bit and so I have to think anything could be tinkered with, you know, is there time to look at the enterprise zone and try to tinker with it to save it? Oh, absolutely. We've actually been working with the legislature for a number of years in terms of this. This act process actually started back in about 2009 when a you know crop of new legislators mm -hmm. came in. The, the main one that's been the, been the proponent of enterprise zones and looking at a way in which to improve them, enhance them, tighten them up, right. as it were, is Assemblymember Perez from my area. Oh. For, for, so Manuel Perez. And, he's, and he at the time was the chair of the Jobs and Economic Development Committee. Is he still in the legislature? Still in the he legislature. Okay. He terms out next year. Okay. And, uh, but he's really been the champion of the program. And he has this bill. Assembly Bill 28. He's working now closely with the new chair of the Jobs and Economic Development Committee, Jose Medina. Sure, from, from, from Riverside. Right, where we are today. Right, as well as Raul Bocanegra from Los Angeles. Right. And so those three are working together to come up with a, a package that's going to tighten things up to take a look at you know, those types of issues that you've looked at to be able to more narrowly focus perhaps some of the looks of you know, the enterprise zone, how it functions, and, you know, and answer some questions that the critics have had. And, and I'm wondering if you know, the governor was really able to muscle the legislature to eliminate redevelopment. If you think about it, redevelopment, more of a democratic program. You know, I, I, if you look at it, it would be a program to, that you would think Democrats would support and Republicans would be a little uh, wary about, but yet it was the Democrats that killed redevelopment. I mean, Republicans were standing up to support redevelopment. And so does the governor have that power to just muscle this through and say, I'm done with, with enterprise zones? It, anything's possible. Of course. You know, Where's as, your eight ball? Uh, exactly. So, you know, anything's possible with that. And, you know, I'm not going to try and predict I the know, legislature. And we all understand that many times, you know, politics trumps policy. Right. And that, you know, that's the reality of things. But that, that said, I think that there's an appetite within the legislature in talking to the different members, in particular, this very, you know, substantially large new crop of members. Right. You know, they're more of the, of you know, amend, don't end. Right. You know, they saw what happened with redevelopment and the bitter taste in their communities and their districts that happened with that and said, hey, couldn't we have just tightened things up like you were talking about? And that's more the appetite, is to amend, don't end, and, and I think that's where the legislature would rather go. In our final moments, could you give us maybe one story of an enterprise zone success? Maybe it's that one person that got hired and it really mattered. Well, I, I think you can look at it from a, a different ways. When I was working in Calexico, the other enterprise zone in Imperial County, we were recruiting a business, and it was between us and, and Arizona. Mm -hmm. And so and they were offering a lot of incentives. They would prefer to be in Calexico. And they ended up coming to Calexico because of the enterprise zone. It was enough of a financial incentive, despite the $200,000 they were offering. And then my office is in the one stop there, and I was able to see people line up and be able to get full-time jobs that previously were you. working in the fields. He's Danny Fitzgerald. He is the manager of the Imperial Valley Enterprise Zone. I'm Brad Pomerantz. This is California Edition. In what country was the concept of enterprise zones 
first developed? Denmark, Germany, Holland, or the United Kingdom? The idea for Enterprise Zones first came to America from the United Kingdom. British House of Commons member Lord Geoffrey Howe and Professor Peter Hall coined the phrase and promoted the concept of Enterprise Zones in 1978. California edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Tom Berryhill. He's a member of the California State Senate, and you may be surprised to learn that he is a recipient of a donor heart. You look phenomenal, <laughs> if I may say. I mean, so often folks who have are recipients of mm -hmm. donor organs, they just never seem to bounce back. Look at you. Yeah, I was very fortunate in uh, the match that I got was pretty close to perfect. I've right. never had a rejection. And then Lord knows I have tested this hard over the years in this legislature, say. but it's worked pretty well. But let's back up if we can and talk about how you came to be a recipient of a donor heart. Yeah, I, uh, I, was, I had a workman's comp settlement when I was 21 years old, had a valve replacement. Uh, the heart never really worked right after that. 26 years, I had a, a valve replacement. Right. And ended up with a cardiac arrest. I just wore the, the old heart out. Oh, right, literally. Literally. And uh, ended up going in. I waited for uh, three months at California Pacific. And, Were you uh, literally in the hospital? I was in the hospital for three, for three months. I had a six-month-old daughter who never was going to know me. Wow. And believe me, uh, every day that I'm out there watching her ski or watching right. her play soccer, she just had two uh, knee operations. Oh no! In soccer, and even those moments are special. Of course, of course. So uh, it's been it's been a great ride. Uh, but they were able to find a heart, as I understand it. It's likely that your donor perished in a some type of vehicular accident. That's mo most of these most of these come about through motorcycle accidents or right. car accidents, and and uh, really because of the helmet laws and the new uh, technology that they have with cars, there's fewer and fewer, which is one of the reasons why we're here today to promote uh, living donations. And let's talk about that, because obviously with a heart situation, there's no living donation yes. possible. And we're just grateful that you were able to receive a heart from someone who sadly uh, died in an accident. I have two friends, sir. Both of them donated kidneys, one to his father, one to her uncle. Mm -hmm. Currently, my wife's uncle is looking for a kidney, and we are all going through the process to see if we are matches. Right. It, it, it's such an amazing gift, and it's a gift that is more likely as a result of work you've done. Well, what's interesting about the Living Donation California, and I'll give you the website information Please. if people want more about it at the end of the program. Yeah, but we'll put it on the screen as well, livingdonationcalifornia.org. Yeah, but. it's interesting. In California, there's 20,000 people waiting for uh, transplants as we sit here today. Three quarters of those are waiting for kidneys. People don't have to die to, to, to give a kidney. Literally. So it's, uh, so it's a very unique... Uh, program that they've got going now and you know when we first started there was only 15,000 <coughs> on the registry our goal back in 2006 was to get a million today as we sit here there's 10 million so it's been a, how does that make you feel uh, that's a very rewarding uh, experience I have to tell you about 10 15 years ago I was working at a studio and there was a call for a bone marrow donation and I gave a sample, and about two years later, I received a call that I had been a preliminary match. Mm -hmm. I was down to one in 5,000. And even though I understand bone marrow donation is very painful, I wanted it to happen. And sadly, I didn't wind up being an ultimate match. Yeah. But what an amazing gift that could have been uh, for me. And so many of us can be part of yeah. the solution. It's interesting, you know, of, of the folks that do donate organs, only one in a hundred deaths you can even take the organs that qualify. Of course. When we come back, sir, I want to continue our conversation Great. about being living donors. We're speaking with Tom Barry Hill, a member of the California State Senate. For our viewers on HLN, thanks for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So, sir, as we continue our conversation, give us a sense of how someone can become a living donor. Okay. Well, yeah, and, and, the, and the way that you do, you just simply sign up on this website. They've got all the information, and uh, they want to go to this living site. Well, I can give it to you right now if you want. Right, please. We're still on our program, so continue. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's livingdonationcalif.org. 
org. Right. What's interesting to me, sir, is as I've learned through my uncle, that if I may not be a match to him, if I'm a match to someone else that needs a right. kidney, I can give my kidney to someone else and then he, I guess, increases on the list because I have been a match for someone else in the system. Absolutely, and that's the beauty of this program is, is it's not necessarily family members at all, but it's just somebody that wants to save a life. Tell us about the legislation that was passed in 2010 and what it has done. It's SB 1395 mm -hmm. and how it's been able to create more opportunities for living donations. Well, there has, and like I said, there was 20, 000, there's 20,000 folks out there today. This is just getting off the ground now, and so uh, one of the reasons that we're on this program today is to try to educate your viewing public right. to where they might, what they might be able to do to, to save a life. And it's interesting because in California, there's about twice as many folks waiting for kidneys as anywhere else in the country. So it's a, it's a big need here now, and uh, anybody that wants to make an absolute difference in somebody's life, uh, I highly recommend taking a look at the, at the website. What would you say to the individual that thinks, wait a sec, I have two kidneys. If I give up one and the other one goes bad, what am I going to do? You know, that's a fear, but I know that there, there's an answer. Well, I, I think that uh, it, it's different for every individual. And I mean, like in my case, you know, there was, some, there was a, a, either a, a girl or a boy that ended up having, having right. to die. Right. Uh, the, the, the nice part about the Living Donation California is that you, you can live with one, one right. kidney. And that, that's the facts. And what I've also learned through my uncle is that if, it's even, if there's even a, the slightest of risk, to a potential donor that's living, you're just, you're eliminated. That's right, you're, that, you, there, there's your one in 100. Yeah, you literally, you're eliminated. So it's not as if, oh, you're close enough, let's grab you. No, I mean, there's no close enough with, and the nice thing right. about kidneys versus a heart transplant, I, it's by gosh and by golly, you get lucky. Right. And, uh, but with kidneys, they can, they can get it down to the perfect match, and that's what they do. The other challenge, though, is transplantation is very expensive. You know that. And so is there a program whereby we can make trans uh, transplantation more affordable, or is this something that insurance will handle? I mean, it's a, we can't ignore that question. Well, in insurance can be brought into it. You know, it costs $60,000 a year to be on dialysis. It costs $120,000 for both people to be transplanted. So what that tells us, and I hate to be so brash, is I mean, in it's, two it's years, it, 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 yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in two years, literally, You've the insurance company has paid it off. Yeah, so it's a good deal for them. Yeah, so if you, if in the final analysis, you can convince your insurance company and show them that this will be Absolutely. a benefit, are you sensing though through your work that insurance companies are becoming to recognize that transplantation is the best way to go? Well, you know, it's interesting because when I, when I first went in for my heart transplant, it's not something you just jump up one day and say, honey, right. you know, I got uh, a great right. idea uh, today. Yeah, let's, let's go in and do something. But, but the technology I found, when I, this was 12 years ago, the technology is so advanced. I asked my doctor many, many questions about this, needless to say. Of course. And there was one day he was sitting on the other side of the bed. He goes, you know, Tom, he goes, uh, heart transplants are way easier than a five-way bypass. He goes, really? really? Just, a, just a matter of hooking up the plumbing. And I looked at him and said, Doc, that's easy for you to say right. sitting on that side of the bed. <laughs> it is interesting because it makes sense. I yeah. mean, it literally yeah. makes sense. Uh, at, at the same time, we know, and you may not know the answer to this, but let me try. The Affordable Care Act is coming into play. Obamacare as we yes. know it. Do you have any sense as to whether that new piece of legislation very large legislation impacts trans, trans, uh, transplants. Well, I I can't believe that it won't. Right. I, I we are very very concerned about quality of care when right. you're adding this many new people to the to the roles. Right. You know, or do we have enough doctors to handle all this? What are we going to do for for the for the working poor that that need transplants? Right. And I think I think it is going to impact it. I don't see how it cannot. Yes, but we don't know where we, don't we know, are we, today. We don't know a lot on on this health care, right. how it's going to okay. ultimately. Well, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, I'm so glad am I. your family's here. His name is Tom Barry Hill. He's a member of the California State Senate. I'm Brad Pomerantz. This is California Edition.